We start very quickly the session dedicated to end-stage liver disease and transplantation. Uh, my name is Richard Moreau. I'm working at Beaujon Hospital, and François Durand, my co-chair, is also working at Beaujon Hospital. And he will be the first speaker. His talk is entitled Management of Patients with Decomposited Cirrhosis. François Durand is a professor of uh, medicine, head of the liver unit at the Beaujon Hospital. François, please. So thank you for the organization committee and a special thank for uh, Patrick uh, who organized, with, organized this nice meeting in, uh, in Paris. So I'm going to talk about uh, decompensated cirrhosis. Those are my disclosures. So decompensated cirrhosis is a, is a severe condition with a high mortality. It is, it is a, a challenging situation. You can see here the, the rate of uh, transition from uh, compensated cirrhosis to decompensated cirrhosis over time, and the rate of uh, progression from compensated cirrhosis to death and from decompensated cirrhosis to death and the probability of uh, dying is, of course, much higher in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. On the right, you can see here that mortality rate is uh, significantly higher in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, and the difference between patients with compensated and, de and decompensated cirrhosis appears very early. So again, uh, this is a, a difficult uh, condition. So I could speak for during hours of decompensated cirrhosis, but I will focus my talk on uh, uh, four uh, uh, topics. Bacterial infections and resistance to antibiotic in cirrhosis, albumin and bacterial infections in cirrhosis, acute kidney injury in cirrhosis, and the management of uh, refractory ascites. Well, bacterial infections are very common in patients with cirrhosis in uh, general, and even more common in patients with uh, decompensated cirrhosis. We know that bacterial infections are associated with a high uh, mortality rate in these patients because uh, this is a trigger of uh, organ failure uh, which can lead to uh, ACLF. There are a number of studies which have shown that uh, bacterial infections are associated with a worse prognosis in patients with cirrhosis. You can see here the results of a meta-analysis confirming the impact of bacterial infections. An emerging problem is uh, that of uh, multidrug resistant uh, infection in uh, Europe as well as in the rest of the world. This is a, a very recent uh, European study which has been promoted by the, the CLIF, showing uh, the distribution of, of prevalence of uh, infections, culture positive infections, and multidrug resistant infections in three parts of Europe Northern Europe, Southern Europe, and Western Europe. As you can see, the prevalence of infections was uh, similar in the different parts of Europe, but uh, culture-positive infections were uh, less common in uh, Southern Europe, and multidrug-resistant infections were also less common in uh, Southern Europe as compared to Northern Europe and Western Europe. But multidrug resistant uh, infections in uh, general had worse prognosis uh, as compared to other infections. If you want to have a more global view, this is a very recent study which is in press, which uh, has been promoted by the International Club of Ascites with uh, Salvatore Piano, uh, um, exploring the distribution of uh, infections in uh, uh, America, North and uh, South America. Asia and uh, Europe. As you can see here, the, the most common infections in these patients were urine, urinary tract infections and uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Uh, Gram-negative infections were more common in Asia as compared to America and uh, Europe. Multidrug-resistant infections were also more common in Asia as well as extended criteria infection. And in this um, uh, cohort, multidrug resistant uh, infections were also associated with uh, worse prognosis. So this is a real uh, burden. So a way to avoid mortality res uh, related to uh, infections in patients with decompensated cirrhosis 
is, of course, uh, to prevent uh, infections. And one of the ways to prevent infection is long-term administration of uh, norfloxacin. Several studies have been conducted with uh, contrasting results, and I show you the last study, which has been conducted by uh, Richard Moreau here. Uh, 291 patients with uh, child uh, puke C cirrhosis, which were, who were randomized to receive norfloxacin or placebo. And in patients uh, with uh, uh, ascites and a low protein concentration, uh, the administration of uh, norfloxacin was associated with uh, lower uh, mortality and the difference was uh, significant. And in parallel, patients receiving um, norfloxacin uh, were at lower risk to develop uh, infections uh, during follow-up. So this is an encouraging uh, result. And uh, interestingly and very importantly, uh, in patients, uh, patients uh, receiving norfloxacin in the long term did not uh, had a higher risk uh, to develop infections with multidrug resistant bacteria, probably because the mechanisms leading to resistance to quinolones are different than mechanisms uh, leading to resistance to other antibiotics. So now let's move to albumin and bacterial infection. We are all living with its old uh, study, relatively old uh, study, uh, which has been published in 1999, and uh, which showed that in patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, concomitant administration of uh, albumin could be associated with less uh, renal impairment and improved uh, survival, uh, reduced uh, in-hospital mortality and reduced three months uh, mortality. And now it is widely recommended to, uh, uh, to uh, per, um, give albumin in combination to antibiotics in patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. But please note that this is a single old study and that the number, the number of patients who have been included in, in this study is relatively uh, limited. Following this study, there have been um, other studies in patients with non-spontaneous bacterial peritonitis infections with contrasting results. I just present you here one of these uh, studies coming from France with uh, two groups of uh, patients, almost uh, 100 patients in each group with non-SBP infections and randomized to an antibiotic plus albumin uh, arm versus an anti antibiotic alone arm. The, the age of the patients was uh, similar. Most of these patients has, uh, had uh, cirrhosis related to alcohol. MEL score was uh, quite high. The main uh, causes of infection were pneumonia and urine, urinary tract infection. But in this study, the authors failed to show a difference in terms of survival between the albumin plus, plus antibiotic and uh, the antibiotic alone group. There is another study coming from, from Spain showing the same results and uh, meta-analysis which show uh, a possible benefit in uh, a combination of antibiotics. Now, these uh, contrasting results have been challenged by a very recent study published in the Lancet, which has been uh, already discussed during this uh, meeting, exploring uh, the potential benefit of long-term administration of albumin in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. A large cohort, more than uh, uh, 400 uh, patients, randomized to albumin for up to 18 months, uh, compared to uh, standard medical uh, treatment. And in this study, long-term administration of albumin was associated with a better uh, prognosis uh, as you can see here, mortality was lower in patients receiving albumin. And in patients receiving albumin, uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis was uh, uh, less common, and uh, the incidence of a non-SBP infection, impaired renal function, and type 1 hepatorenal syndrome, syndrome were uh, lower. So now we are faced with a a kind of a paradox because we have a, an old evidence that albumin plus antibiotics are superior to antibiotics alone is, as in SBP. We have no clear evidence, or we had no clear evidence that albumin plus antibiotics are superior to antibiotics alone in, bac in bacterial infections other than SBP, 
And now we have very recent evidence that albumin may improve survival in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, and that this improve in improvement in survival is at least in part uh, due to uh, decreasing, <coughs> sorry, uh, decreasing, decreased rate of bacterial infections other than SBP. So all of this will have to be uh, clarified. Now, acute injury in cirrhosis. Well, acute injury is uh, common in cirrhosis. This is an all, another uh, cause of uh, mortality. It, uh, the incidence of AKI can be up to 19, 20% in hospitalized patients with uh, cirrhosis. And we know that the progression of AKI is associated with a higher mortality. There are some difficulties in the diagnosis of AKI in patients with cirrhosis because serum creatinine overestimates GFR. Urine output is poorly informative because, especially in patients with refractory uh, cystis who are uh, frequently oliguric. There are different phenotypes of AKI with different prognosis and a need for early initiation of, er of specific therapies in specific phenotypes, and I think about vasopressors in hepatorenal syndrome. So the criteria for the definition of uh, AKI in cirrhosis had to be revised. These criteria have been revised uh, recently with the ESOL and the International Club of Ascites, and now uh, the objective is to uh, recognize AKI at, at an earlier stage. And now the definition of AKI in cirrhosis is a modest increase in serum creatinine, uh, more than 26.5 micromole per liter within 48 hours, or an increase in creatinine of at least 50% within uh, seven days. Then. Uh, hepatorenal syndrome has been incorporated as one of the phenotypes of AKI in cirrhosis with the following criteria. Ascites, no response after two days of volume expansion with albumin, no recent use of nephrotoxic agents, and no evidence of structural uh, kidney uh, injury. And then there are the other phenotypes which are uh, frequently observed in cirrhosis, prerenal failure and uh, acute tubular necrosis. Other criteria that I will not develop uh, help stage AKI and determine the progression according to uh, response to therapy. It is important to identify patients with uh, uh, HRS, HRS AKI at an early stage because these patients should receive um, uh, terlipressin. And the uh, criteria uh, consisting uh, in two days of uh, expansion uh, with albumin uh, before starting telepressing uh, maybe should be challenged in the future because it delays introduction of therapy. Telepressing can be administered either as uh, boluses or with a continuous infusion, and whether one or the other of these options is superior uh, has been a matter of debate. So we have now a recent study, uh, an Italian study, comparing continuous infusion of uh, terlipressin in uh, patients with uh, hepatorenal syndrome to intravenous uh, boluses. Uh, these patients had, had a high male score, which is not surprising, a high uh, level of serum creatinine, a similar response rate, similar mortality rate, but the difference is uh, side effects, which were less common in patients receiving um, uh, continu continuous uh, infusion. So this option should be preferred to uh, boluses. Now the last part is uh, the management of refractory ascites. TIPS is one of the options in, uh, in refractory uh, ascites. There are several studies showing that TIPS is uh, effective at uh, um, treating refractory ascites as compared to medical management, but most studies did not find uh, evidence of uh, lower mortality in patients receiving TIPS as compared to large volume parasynthesis. This, uh, these uh, data have been challenged by a recent uh, uh, study uh, conducted by the equipe of Toulouse in, uh, in France. Uh, 62 patients with at least two large volume, para, two large volume parasynthesis within uh, more than uh, three weeks. 
And uh, these patients were comparable in, terms, in terms of age, uh, cause of cirrhosis, alcohol was the uh, what leading cause of uh, cirrhosis, number of uh, parasynthesis on male score, and in this study there was a clear survival advantage in patients receiving TIPS. So these results are interesting, but uh, first, um, um, severe ascites is different from refractory ascites, and second, these patients had a low male score uh, because TIPS is contraindicated in patients with a high male score, which is a serious limitation. So we had TIPS, and now uh, alpha pump is uh, an, emerging, uh, an emerging alternative to paracentesis in patients with um, uh, cirrhosis and refractory ascites. So this is uh, the principle. You have two lines which are, which are inserted subcutaneously, one line which is in the peritoneal cavity and the other line in the, in the bladder. So the ascites is uh, pumped uh, with a, a system uh, which derives uh, ascites in the bladder and uh, ascites is eliminated with uh, urine. We have small pre preliminary studies comparing alpha pump to uh, paracentesis. Uh, show, uh, you can see a um, relatively limited number of, uh, of patients. Uh, the male score was low in this uh, study. Uh, infections were comparable in the two groups. Uh, there was a trend to higher serum creatinine in patients treated with uh, alpha pump, at, the, at least at the beginning of the, of the treatment, but the difference was not significant. The main difference is that the number of paracentesis was, of course, uh, lower in patients uh, treated by alpha pump, and uh, the quality of life was uh, significantly uh, improved. So it is an emerging option which may be efficient in patients with uh, uh, refractory ascites and uh, uh, trials are needed to know if there is a survival benefit. So uh, to conclude, decompensated cirrhosis is still associated with a high mortality rates in the absence of transplantation. Bacterial infections are a major source of mortality. Multidrug resistance is common in Europe and even more common in Asia. Long-term uh, ad long administration of norfloxacin may improve survival in patients with ascites and low protein concentration without increasing the incidence of multidrug resistant ba bacteria. Long-term administration of albumin may improve survival in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, but the role of uh, albumin in non-SBP infections needs to be uh, clarified. An issue is uh, whether norfloxacin plus albumin could do better than uh, uh, each of these uh, two options. Tips, tips may improve survival in patients with persistent uh, ascites, but it needs to be confirmed with uh, um, uh, current techniques and cover tips in uh, patients with uh, refractory ascites. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the use of tips is limited by encephalopathy and disease severity. Patients with a high male score may not receive a tips. Alpha pump could be an alternative to paracentesis or tips in patients waiting for transplantation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francois, for this outstanding lecture. I suggest to club the questions at the end. And uh, now? Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Adrian Gadano from uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, who is going to talk about optimal management of portal hypertension. Adrian. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, Francois, and uh, special Thank uh, for Patrick Marcelin again for inviting me to this uh, outstanding meeting. So uh, this is my disclosures concerning this uh, issue. Um, first of all, to uh, begin this uh, uh, lecture, I want to uh, strengthen the importance of uh, staging these patients, the patients with portal hypertension, uh, into one of these uh, uh, two different uh, stages of cirrhosis. Uh, what I want to um, uh, um, say is that it's very different a patient with portal hypertension in a compensated phase of cirrhosis than in a decompensated phase. So this is very different concerning risk stratification and 
the individual care of these patients. So, so this, is, this is the first thing we have to do when we face a patient with portal hypertension. Also, in compensated cirrhosis, we can find patients with mild portal hypertension. So in these patients, the portal pressure is less than 10, expressed by the hepatic venous pressure gradient. Or we can have a patient with clinically significant portal hypertension where the portal hypertension raises uh, at 10 or over 10. And this patient may have no varices or may have varices almost half and half of, of these patients. So we have to do this um, uh, split when we see a patient and uh, stage the patient in uh, one of these categories. Because if the patient is decompensated, the risk uh, is of uh, complica more complications or even death is uh, much higher. And on a pathophysiology point of view, very rapidly, uh, you know that there is increased hepatic resistance at the beginning, and this is followed by increased portal blood flow, which uh, is a, a consequence of splanchnic vasodilation and hyperdynamic syndrome, resulting in portal hypertension, collateral circulation, and varices. At the uh, first stage, when there is subclinic portal hypertension, so the gradient is from 6 to 10, uh, there is only uh, pr uh, probably mainly resistance to portal blood flow in the liver. There are uh, very thin septa, or maybe there, there is no cirrhosis at this stage, but advanced uh, fibrosis. But it, there is also already a functional component in these patients that may play a role. The aim in these patients will be, uh, with already portal hypertension, will be to only to uh, intervene over the etiology of the liver disease, uh, for instance, treating hepatitis B or C or alcoholic uh, uh, liver disease or treating NASH, and to prevent the outcome to the following stage, which is clinical significant portal hypertension. If we cannot achieve that, uh, resistance to portal blow will increase Splanchnic hyperdynamic circulation will occur, and patients will reach more than 10 millimeters of uh, 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 portal pressure and will achieve the stage of clinically significant portal hypertension. And this is a different patient, which is uh, more fragile and um, uh, a patient that can develop uh, severe complications of cirrhosis, ascites, bleeding, uh, encephalopathy, hepatocellular carcinoma infections, etc., and this is uh, associated, of course, with a higher mortality rate. And you can see here in this couple of studies uh, that patients with uh, HBPG more than 10 have more clinical decompensation and uh, more development of hepatocellular carcinoma, and of course, more than 10 of uh, portal pressure is associated with increased mortality. So the main objective in this uh, stage will be to prevent the development of complications and to reduce death. So gastroesophageal varices develop in uh, approximately 40% of patients with compensated cirrhosis and in up to 85% of decompensated. So it's, this is very different also between these two uh, stages. The incidence of first variceal bleeding is about 30%. And the mortality in this first episode uh, uh, ranges from 10 to 25%, uh, again, depending on the patient. The variceal rebleeding rate is 60% at one year, and the mortality in these patients is much higher, about 50%. So how can we intervene in these patients uh, from a, uh, uh, different, uh, with different tools that we may have? We can act on increased hepatic resistance by treating the etiological uh, um, cause of the liver disease, or we can act with carvedilol, which is a non-selectic beta blocker with a, an, an alpha-1 antagonist effect, so it will decrease hepatic resistance, or we can place a TIPS. We can also uh, act on the extrahepatic uh, territory by, with non-selectic beta, beta blockers, uh, reducing splanchnic vasodilation or decreasing hyperdynamic circulation, and so decreasing uh, uh, portal blood flow or with other vasoactive drugs, somatostatin and analogs, vasopressin and analogs like terlipressin, for instance. Or we can directly act on the varices by endo uh, endoscopic therapy, different uh, uh, strategies, or also by uh, transvenous obliteration. So we are going to uh, look at the different scenarios and see how can we help these patients. First, 
pre-primary prophylaxis. So what can we do with a patient with portal hypertension that still has not developed varices? All patients with cirrhosis, and this is the Bavino uh, six uh, recommendations, should be screened uh, for varices at diagnosis. This is very interesting because in patients with uh, fibros kind of less than 20 and with more than 150 uh, uh, platelets, uh, uh, they, they have less than 5% chance of having varices, so we can avoid endoscopy in these patients. The cause of liver disease, of course, should be treated. Do we have to do something more in these patients without viruses? There is no indication up to now to use beta blockers to prevent the formation of viruses. And this was demonstrated years ago in this uh, study with a very long-term follow-up with one uh, arm of placebo, the other arm of uh, timolol, where there were no difference uh, in the uh, um, probability of remaining free of viruses. Now, this study included patients with uh, no sig clinically significant portal hypertension. Uh, uh, almost half of the patients had, had less than 10 uh, millimeters of mercury of uh, portal pressure. So, of course, beta blockers are not going to uh, give benefit on those patients since vasodilation is not present yet. So, let's move with a very recent uh, uh, study in this study, which is not still published, will be soon, uh, published soon in Lancet, uh, this group studied the uh, potential beneficial effects of beta blockers in patients without varices, without varices, uh, but with clinical significant portal hypertension. They measured uh, portal pressure in all patients, and then the, 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 respond, the acute responders to propranolol, they uh, indicated propranolol, and the others they indicated carvedilol, and they followed these patients uh, uh, for a, a long time. Uh, and they uh, saw the development of viruses, but also that were treated with band ligation, but also all the complications uh, of uh, cirrhosis. And very inter interestingly, they saw that in the beta blocker group, the uh, clinical uh, uh, decompensating events were reduced uh, markedly, and uh, for instance, ascites was reduced to uh, 50, in 50% 50 of the patients. So patients without viruses, but with clinical significant portal hypertension may be benefit by um, a treatment with uh, non-selective uh, beta blockers. What can we do in patients that do have viruses to prevent the first uh, bleeding episode? All these patients, by definition, they have clinical significant portal hypertension. Patients with um, uh, medium or large varices uh, have to receive prima, uh, primary prophylaxis, as well as, as patients with small varices with rail well signs, as well as patients with decompensate, uh, that are decompensated and have small varices. The reduction in more than 10% of the uh, HBPG induced by beta blockers is associated not only with a decrease in the development of varices, but also, as we said before, with the decrease in uh, decompensation of the cirrhosis. So this is a main uh, uh, point when treating these patients with uh, beta blockers. So we are not only preve preventing uh, varicial uh, development, but mostly we are preventing decompensation and death. Either non-selective beta blockers or uh, band ligation, one or the other, can be used to prevent uh, varicell uh, hemorrhage in these patients, and the selection of these uh, treatments will depend on the, the patient characteristics. In cases that uh, uh, NSBB have to be discontinued because of intolerance, we can, of course, uh, switch these patients to car carvedilol, and because uh, body cell ligation is a local therapy. Patients have to be followed up um, uh, when varices are eradicated to see if uh, they have a body cell recurrence. Let's move now to the treatment of acute uh, bleeding. We have a dozen of uh, recommendations in these patients. Of course, uh, 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 some of them are uh, stated uh, uh, a long time ago as, as ICU placement of the patient, ABC, intubation. Very important, we have, again, to stratify patient, what, which patient we have uh, uh, in the ICU. 
Antibiotics, very important, I will say something about that. IV vasoactive therapy, blood transfusion to uh, uh, lead uh, hemoglobin to, from seven to nine, no recommendation up to now to uh, uh, correct coagulopathy. Uh, rapid endoscopic therapy with band ligation, ultrasound, possibility of a balloon or possibility of endoscopic stents and the possibility of tips. Uh, even um, uh, with this, despite these uh, recommendations, much of these are not, have, are not done. Uh, you can see that sclerotherapy is done in, uh, still in many centers or no endoscopic intervention, maybe because they have no uh, these tools, but Everybody has antibiotics, and antibiotics are ad administered in only half of these patients. Uh, and early tips in a recent study ha has been shown to be placed only in 10% of patients that had indications of uh, early tips. So let's go a little bit with uh, these uh, points. Five-year mortality in then is uh, very different depending on the characteristic of the patient. If the hemorrhage occurs in an, uh, as an isolated event, or if the, the bleeding occurs with other, together with other complications of the, cirrhotic, of the cirrhosis as ascites, encephalopathy, infections, uh, etc. These patients have a very high mortality over 80%. Regarding infections, uh, uh, years ago there were identified patients at risk of having infections with more severe cirrhosis and these patients uh, have to be more protected with ceftriaxone and not with norfloxacin. Uh, and re very recently, it has been suggested, uh, taking into account the, the probability of multi-resistance uh, uh, bacteria in the institution or in the patient that has been hospitalized uh, in other institution, that maybe uh, we, c we have to escalate to a more uh, potent uh, or higher spectrum antibiotic uh, um, uh, indication. Uh, but this is not still uh, in guidelines. Regarding the vasoactive treatment, we have three options, uh, terlipressin, somatostatin, and octreotide, and this elegant study have shown that they are, uh, the three of them, they are the same, uh, uh, given by five days, concerning the control of bleeding, the mortality of these patients, and the five-day treatment success. So you can use one of these three and uh, uh, indicate as soon as you can. Regarding endoscopy, uh, endos um, band ligation has been shown to be superior to sclerotherapy, so is the recommended treatment uh, to do also uh, as soon as you can. Even with those uh, treatments, vasoactive and endoscopic treatment, uh, about 10 to, uh, 15 to 20 percent of the patients will keep on bleeding and mortality in these patients is very high. So we have different pro uh, possibilities, repeat, depending on the patient. Repeat endoscopy and treatment, or use a balloon or a stent, or maybe uh, place a tips. Let's uh, see how uh, can we, everybody knows the tamponade, we have used it, we use it in many uh, centers in Latin America still now, but we know that it's uh, uh, associated with complica complications and we can uh, place a, a, a balloon uh, for no more than 24 or 48 hours. So this has been replaced uh, in many centers by uh, fully covered expandable uh, metallic stents, which are easy to uh, implant, more easy than the balloons. Uh, they are effective, they are safe, and the advantage is that they can be uh, uh, left uh, over seven days in, in these patients. So they may be a real bridge to uh, tips or to liver transplantation. These are the stents, you know them already. There was a study with a very few number of patients, but that demonstrated uh, in favor or to, of uh, stents, uh, more success of therapy, more control of bleeding, more, uh, less infusion and less adverse events, and less necessity of tips when compared with uh, the balloon placement. This study did not uh, show any uh, effect on uh, survival, but there were very few patients. Then we have TIPS. TIPS have, uh, has been used, uh, have been used for rescue since 20 years now. So when everything uh, uh, fails, we have TIPS and we, we can uh, use a TIPS. And TIPS is uh, very useful to control bleeding, of course, in almost or in 100%, it will control bleeding. But the problem has been that TIPS 
uh, has been indicated uh, too late when everything fails and the patient, uh, mostly severe patients, are already in multi-organ failure. So mortality with TIPS in this indication, as, as, as in, 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 uh, with this strategy, has been, has been very high, from 30, 40, 50 percent or more of the patients. And so the question has been in this last year, should TIPS be placed earlier in high-risk patients? And this was uh, explored in this first uh, uh, study, which was uh, published about almost 10 years ago, uh, showing that in patients, child B with active bleeding or patients child C with child score equal or less than 13, the uh, placement or, of an early TIPS, that means in the first 72 hours, versus standard medical therapy was uh, um, significantly um, better in the control of bleeding and also in survival. So the early uh, placement of a TIPS in these specific, specific patients has been recommended in the last uh, guidelines and consensus, and it was recommended in the last Bavino uh, uh, conference. But it is well known that criteria for the patients should be, that, that was only one study, criteria should be uh, refined. And there, therefore, there were other studies, like these uh, uh, very recent studies, uh, that also showed that in patients with child C, early TIPS were very effective and should be used. Uh, but in patients with child B and active bleeding, this was not very clear, uh, uh, at least not in this study, which had more uh, patients than the first study. And there was another uh, uh, recent Asiatic study that also no uh, question that it is uh, useful and beneficial in child C patients, but we should refine the indication in child B patients, where probably it is useful in some of the patients and not in other. Then we have the prevention of recurrent bleeding, and this is uh, first-line therapy is the combination here. You have to give both non-selective beta blockers plus uh, endoscopic band ligation. And uh, cover tips is the treatment of choice if this uh, treatment fails. This is very clear. And because carvedilol has not been compared to current uh, standard of therapy in this uh, population uh, uh, as a secondary uh, pre prophylaxis, its use cannot be uh, recommended for prevention of rebleeding. I want to say something about statins uh, because there are recent studies also with uh, statins in this population of patients. Uh, simvastatin has been uh, shown to be uh, effective in decreasing uh, death and, decrease, and, and no, with no change in rebleeding, and again, this is uh, associated with a decrease in the decompensation of these patients. Simvastatin is uh, given on top of uh, standard uh, of care, on, so on top of uh, pharmacological and of uh, um, endoscopic therapy. Uh, also here, you can see another recent study where uh, death uh, and decompensation was reduced by statin uh, um, use. We don't still know, we still don't know the exactly uh, characteristics of, pa of patients that will benefit uh, from this and the doses, which are quite low in these studies, but this is uh, um, uh, very interesting to keep on uh, uh, research on this uh, issue. For to finish, a couple of issues with uh, beta blockers. Two issues uh, are the use in refractory ascites and uh, their use in decompensated cirrhosis, which, is, which are not uh, refractory ascites. The first uh, population of patients, uh, uh, this has been studied in the, in the, the, the three thirds studies. This is the second study where they took uh, 170 patients. Half of them were treated with non-selective beta blockers. They were all uh, patients with refractory ascites. And what they uh, have observed is that the treatment in these patients with uh, non-selective beta blockers were, was highly associated with uh, more probability of death and was one of the most, uh, of the highest independent predictors of death uh, in these patients. So we don't have to use beta blockers in patients with refractory ascites. Probably they induce uh, uh, paracentesis induced circulatory dysfunction. And patients with refractory ascites that are on beta blockers have to be uh, shift to uh, band ligation.
On the contrary, on decompensated cirrhosis, uh, these uh, um, uh, treatments have a beneficial effect. As you can see here, um, patients treated with propranolol uh, after the first bleeding, they have less rebleeding, less uh, uh, recurrence of ascites, and less SBP. So we cannot do, we can uh, uh, really uh, 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 indicate uh, in these decompensated cirrhotic patients uh, uh, propranolol, and there are some uh, uh, background explaining the benefit of this uh, the, uh, medication in these patients. So uh, these are my take-home messages. Cirrhosis should be managed now in uh, two different clinical stages, compensated and decompensated, defined by the presence or absence of clinical uh, complications. The identification of patients with cirrhosis and clinical, clinically significant Portal hypertension is mandatory. Non-invasive tests will be soon of great help as diagnostic tools, uh, for instance, uh, the, the level of uh, the measure of fi our fiber scan. In patients with uh, cirrhosis and CSPH, but without varices, the objective of the treatment should be no longer or not only to prevent varices, but also to prevent clinical decompensation. New data concerning therapy related to this issue as I've shown you, uh, is being generated. In patients with compensated cirrhosis, uh, it has been shown that statins may lower the incidence of decompensation and lower mortality. Therefore, they uh, might become an additional tool in the management of these patients. After an episode of acute variceal bleeding in patients at high risk of failure or rebleeding, um, and early tips may benefit selected patients, all child C patients, and maybe some child B patients. And non-selected beta blockers should not be uh, used in patients with uh, refractory ascites, but of course they can benefit patients with non-refractory ascites. With this I want to finish. I want to thank first uh, Didier Lebrec, uh, which was my first uh, master, the father of non-selected beta blockers, therapy in portal hypertension, and also, of course, uh, Richard Moreau, which was uh, the father, or maybe the big brother of uh, this speaker, myself, on the optimal uh, therapy in portal hypertension. And also thank my team. Thank you very much. So, uh, it is my pleasure now to present the next speaker, Philippe Mathurin, professor of medicine, head of the gastroenterology department in Lille, Lille, Lille score, <laughs> well known, and he, he was also a pioneer for uh, liver transplantation in patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis who are uh, resistant to corticosteroids, and we will be very happy to hear you. Uh, thank you, Richard, for this kind invitation. Thank you, for Patrick, for inviting me and for this uh, uh, outstanding meeting. So I, I would say how it would look like in 2019. So just to tell you that we start because now we know that at early times, the patients who are not responding to med medical therapy are definitely the patients who need to be considered for any additional therapy. As you can see, using the LEAD score, which you can be, it's a, you can calculate the score after seven days of therapy. As you can see, those patients who are classified as non-responder have a very worse outcome. So definitely this was, was the first point where the uh, French and Belgium clinicians start because they do consider that those patients deserve to have new therapy. So another thing is that every time we are talking about liver transplantation, we always are talking about liver alcohol relapse, but we never consider that among those patients who are not uh, uh, no have been transplanted for uh, non-related alcoholic liver disease, if you are looking at alcohol use before and after, there is no significant difference. Because every time I'm telling people are talking about alcohol relapse, just be, uh, talking about alcohol use after liver transplantation, if you are considering the other candidate, you will have the fine, same things. But the issue, which is very important, is, uh, is that in alcoholic liver disease, you have a higher percentage of having heavy drinking behavior after liver transplantation, and this behavior is associated with uh, 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 recurrence of the alcoholic liver disease and also uh, 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 um, increased risk of death at long term. So, and the second point that all the, up to now, the center are relying on the six month rule, but definitely where are the data? I just want to show you that this uh, criteria in terms of statistical weight 
when you are looking at only as a statistician issue, as a statistical issue, this is the rock curve of the, of the sober period before translation. It's completely irrelevant because this area of the curve is close to the fact that you are launching a coin in order to get an answer. And why? Because always we mix the point. It's a very good inclusion criteria, meaning that when a patient is having more six months of sober period, definitely the risk of, of patient the risk of relapse is very low, but conversely, it's a bad exclusion criteria, meaning that you cannot exclude a patient with this type of, of, of criteria because the patient has a 60% probability of, of, of being sober after liver transplantation. And just to show you that, in fact, it takes a while, but when you go to the, to the tribunal, to the justice, I said, can tell you that already we have the answer for a long time in 86 a, a person sue a liver transplantation in the uh, in United States. And look at what was the answer from the judge. He said, it's high operative, may not survive, but without enough six months of expert opinion. So meaning that the court said, it's arbitrary and unreasonable to use a six month period as a criterion for liver transplantation. And, uh, this is why when the, the French Conference of Consensus, I think it was a starting point, the jury state when they look at the fact that now we are able to predict at early times that the patient had a high risk of death. The jury states that the wait and watch strategy using this criteria is unfair for those non-responders and they recommend pilot study evaluating early liver transplantation in non responder This was a key point because this allowed the Belgium and the French center to move on and to perform this early liver transplantation in patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis not responding to medical therapy. And this, always I quote this study on the behalf of the other colleagues because those guys were crazy enough to follow uh, this idea. And, but they, they, was, they were very strict at, time, at that time. What they did, they first, they said, we're going to perform liver transplantation only in a patient who have his first liver decompensation event of liver disease, meaning that this guy came at the hospital with a dead hand without f having known that, uh, been aware that he have uh, uh, liver cirrhosis. Non-responders were used by the least score, but also by the worsening of liver function because as any score, this score may fail. A patient may be classified as a responder, but when you, you look at responders, generally speaking, their, their uh, biological function are improving over the, over the time. And when a patient is classified as a responder, and you start to have a, a, a rapid deterioration of the, liver, of the liver function. It means that the least score is not effective. So you have to use both aspects to to, to consider the guy who going to die. And there are a, a drastically selected absolute consensus, social integration, supportive family uh, member, and psychiatric evaluation and addictive profile. And in fact, we use a kind of decision circle, which is up to now still ongoing in the French center. So you have the family circle. And what we did think is very important. When this family circle, meaning the relationship between the patient and his family is broken, I don't consider that you can go further because it will be very tough to under the patient after the transplantation. Thereafter, the senior in hepatology will come. So therefore, this evaluation is generally performed by the resident, the, the nurse, and the other person who are there. And therefore, this is where uh, I am coming, with, which I call the senior hepatologist. And you, you can see also there will be a psychiatric. The psychiatric, the addiction specialist, will make his own evaluation without interfering with the team. And then after that, the surgeon and anesthetist are coming. And after those four decision cycles have their own evaluation of the patient, we have a meeting and then we decide whether or not the patient will be the candidate to liver transplantation. And as a consequence in this study, as you can see, those patients were very sick with a, 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 a little score around 0 0.9. As you can see, the maximum of the little score is one. More you get close to one, uh, worse is your uh, survival. And the med on first day of, uh, of therapy was uh, 30, and at least 44, showing you that the patient is still deteriorating his liver function upon the, the time you are uh, selecting this patient for this, pro pro this program. And as you can see, it was a simple answer in terms of survival. This is a patient who are not transplanted during the time of this study. And as you can see, there is a patient who are considered for early liver transplantation, as you can see, the outcome, you multiply by three the probability of being alive six months later.
And uh, one thing came uh, to this study is that the fact that do you, could, do you have to choose your control, but it was the control was chosen, were chosen at that time by the physicians. So therefore what we did, we performed a, a selection using a, a software who pick up in, our, in the database of Lille and Brussels all the patients, and therefore we are able to match those patients on pre-established range of age, gender, madre function. And at that time, we decided also to look at the same patient, and the only thing will be different, those patients will, will be responders. So this sub-analysis allows us to show one interesting thing, is that you switch completely the outcome of a non-responder using early liver transplantation to the outcome of a responder. Like the guy you shift completely his, uh, uh, his uh, spontaneous behavior will be there, to, a, to a, 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 an outcome of a responder uh, to therapy, to medical therapy. So the issue that has been pointed out just before by Nora, which is very important, and I think it's not infection, it's Asperger's infection. And when you look at this, it is very important, at least in our center, in the French center, we are facing the issue of Asperger's infection, and I am uh, suggesting more and more that probably we need to shorten the steroid as much as we can, and I do think also in the most severe patient, we can also not, I think we may not use a steroid in those patients, I will show you this later on, but definitely Asperger's infection is an important one, and this needs to be carefully uh, uh, investigated before liver transplantation. And as you can see also, male score, and all those patients had a male score higher than this, uh, this cutoff, how an independent associated predictive factor of Asperger's. In terms of relapse, this study observes that three, three uh, persons who relapse, none of them relapse uh, on, uh, I would say, heavy drinking, even two remain daily consumers, and therefore this study was considered as a uh, relevant enough to be uh, at least tested in other centers. In terms of every time people are talking about burden, how much graph you will consume on this indication, as I can tell you, our, at least in our end, it's few patients. Few patients have been considered for liver transplantation in uh, alcoholic liver disease. Uh, when you look at this very strict uh, 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 selection process, and uh, as an example, in our center, two, cent two percent only on the, on our, the global cohort have been currently selected for early liver transplantation. So do, do organ donation will be affected uh, by early liver transplantation? So as pointed out in a very interesting review on the ethical issue related to early liver transplantation, he said that the use of liver transplantation may negatively affect the public attitude on transplantation and organ donation. This needs to be tested, and we show you one study at least who did that, that did that. It may cause reluctance to clinicians, the part of clinicians, to modify guidelines, because definitely guidelines may be, may be modified according to this type of selection. And, but I think it's our job to inform uh, the, clinic, the public that the patient with self-inflicted disease were on the same access to medical research as other patients, because as an example, we always talk about obese patients, but don't forget obese patients is most of them are behavior-related behavior, uh, disease. So this was an online uh, survey, which was uh, uh, distributed using an Amazon web, uh, web service. A very interesting study from in the United States. So they put a, the survey population was a very important one, 70, uh, around 50 and 500 pa patients. So those patients were uh, well balanced. Uh, the uh, race ethnicity are the representative of the race ethnicity in the United States. And that what they did, they looked at those patients who are considered as they have, they have never been involved in liver transplantation, so, but they are potential candidates for organ donation. And what they, this is to tell you that those patients were the, the global distribution of organ donation in the United States, make it a short story. They asked them, what do you think about this early liver transplantation program? Only 18% of them said they are completely disagree, but conversely, 30% or were neutral or agree or strongly agree. So does it mean that early transplantation seems not to affect the public who are the uh, candidate for liver uh, for organ donation? And the thing which is very important, which I think it will depend on the country, because in the United States, good financial stability is an important one. In France, it's not, because as you know, social security is taking all the, uh, all the expense. And uh, good social support, which is not also so important for us, but at least in the United States, it's important, but age is important. And as you can see, 
Younger age is an issue because younger age is associated with a high risk of relapse of alcohol and particularly in a, a heavy drinking behavior. But one thing I want to raise now is that now it's, it's time to that the scientific society need, need to, to model their guidelines according to data just to show you. This is where we start in French. This was uh, f from the group of Didier in Liver Transplantation. They look at the practice of the French center. As you can see before the study, there is a switch because most of the center which was not involved, most of them now did perform and it's going up, up upon the time. <coughs> and also this, as I said, challenged completely the rule of uh, the, the sober period rule, as you can see. Uh, now 29% are using only one to, to, uh, to three month abstinence rule. And therefore this also will probably change, as I said, the section of the patient in the near future, particularly the patient with a CLF. And uh, as you can see, addictologists are very involved in our center. And uh, after this study, most of them now have been involved before transplantation, after liver transplantation in the selection process. And I think it's a very important issue. Let's look one country by one country. German, it's a very tough thing because for German, for being candidate to, to liver transplantation, you have to, uh, to be abstinent. You have to be, uh, to, to be uh, this abstinence must be proven by at least two negative tests during the six months. And uh, a positive uh, psychiatric assessment is mandatory for before, before listening. So for being a candidate in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, it's quite complicated. And after that, they update their, their, their guidelines in Germany. But look at what they said. Exceptional case may be considered, but you need to address to a committee of specialists of that at the Bundel started Telkammer. I'm sorry about my uh, German pronunciation, but never, what does it mean? It means that you have so much things to do that the guy is already dead, and therefore they are not performing liver transplantation because the time to transplantation has to be at a early time. Italy, they just move away and move just, they, they, add, they adopt, I would say, the European statement and the French statement. And the UK, as usual, so before Brexit, do not worry, before and after everything is open to discussion, as you know, including early liver transplantation. But nevertheless, before 2000, uh, 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 to, 2014, it was listed as an absolute contraindication. But after that, the NHS allows the, 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 uh, the UK center to perform liver transplantation in civil hepatitis. And I do think that Neuburger, who was the leader at, for this uh, experiment, I think he told, he told the good thing. He said that we transplant human, not angels, and therefore we don't have to think about behavior of patients. So now, at least the, the European guidelines on alcohol liver disease strongly recommend early liver transplantation for those patients who are highly selected with severe alcohol hepatitis not responding to medical therapy. And, uh, the Canadians are against it, just to show you. They clearly said that you cannot perform liver transplantation even in the case of severe alcoholic hepatitis. So up to now in Canada, you cannot be considered as a candidate. Conversely, in the United States, it changed. And the first paper who came out was a paper from him who clearly shows the same things in us in terms of, of, uh, of uh, outcome. And this is, has been already stated by, by Nora, as you can see the number of early trivial transplantation in the United States is going up, and also the number of transplant units who are doing this uh, procedure. And this probably comes from the evaluation of the group of NOHA uh, and uh, Lee. And this has been this uh, accelerated study, it's a retrospective study, but nevertheless, this study clearly shows that the outcome of patient is very good, and the use of alcohol are very limited as compared to what we are observing to uh, the patient who are uh, selected with the six-month rule. The re relapse rate is around 30% at long term. And uh, which is different than what we are observing, is they, are, they observe that the relapse in alcohol is associated with a worse outcome as compared to those guys who are considered without alcohol use and those with alcohol use. And in our experience, we don't have that result in our study, and I will talk about this later on, probably due to the selection process. So what was associated with, uh, with uh, um, uh, death, as I mentioned, is was any alcohol use post liver transplantation, but again, we don't have this result in our cohort. So we need to improve selection. Definitely, I think we, win. we need to select the complete respond non-responder. We call that in Lille the null responder using the uh, new cutoff of the Lille score at 0 0.56, which is more restrictive. But I do think the best way is to combine the thing. 
let me explain one thing. If a guy is coming to your unit with a male score around 36, the only way to bring him down to this type of mortality is liver transplantation. Because for going to this risk of death, the guy had to have a liver score around 0 0.15. If you go to, to bring this guy around 10% of mortality, you have to have a very, very low Lille score. And I can tell you, according to the severity of the disease, you will not, never be able to do it without liver transplantation, at least nowadays. So this is why also to confirm, as usual, you need to confirm. So this is a confirmatory study. It was a protocol that was funded by the French uh, uh, health agency. So this study was the following. We use a control group for liver transplantation, where the classical selected with the six one criteria. Those guys were con compared to the patient with not responding to medical, uh, uh, to medical uh, therapy. Those guys were, were, were selected using an algorithm score. It's a reproducible algorithm score. If the guy was, or the woman was higher than 220, of score, he was selected. The guy with this score was not selected. The primary endpoint is the study is non-inferiority in terms of alcohol relapse. The secondary endpoint is survival benefit. As you can imagine, it's not a blinded study. We already have the answer. We just show again the benefit. And this paper we present, I think, this month. And this is the, where the team is doing the algorithm, because as mentioned, is a decision circle. So in conclusion, after first episode of alcoholic hepatitis, early transplantation may be proposed in non-responders as most death occur within two months in the wait and watch and wait strategy. We need to confirm this result by other group, and I do think that the data from United States are quite encouraging, and I think the Italian group will present their data. We need international dat database to collect information on survival and addiction to provide more facts and less conjunctures. And I do think that the PHRC quick transaction, which is finished, by the way, we are just now closing all the, the analysis. And I do think this uh, study will provide an, a robust algorithm for the selection of the patient. Thank you very much for your attention. We have very few time. One question per speaker. And uh, I didn't see any question in the audience, unless somebody raised his hand now. So, yes, me. Dr. Turo. Yes, you have a mic? Go, go to the mic. Do you go? Yes, go to the mic. The alpha pump. So this is a, sort of a new thing. And I'm wondering, has it been evaluated, though, in anybody who has a higher MEL score? Are we going to be faced with the same challenges as TIPS? Because you raised it as a potential option for the patient with refractory ascites who's not a TIPS candidate. But I noticed that the study really is doing it in patients with low MEL scores. Can you speak to the issue of kind of the sicker patient? Is it going to be an option? In, in patients with a high no, no the score. alpha pump alpha pump alpha. oh yeah. yeah it does not seem to be a problem it's uh, it needs a uh, general anesthesia but um, um, high melt score does not seem to to be a contraindication for alpha pump except perhaps that uh, we should be cautious with uh, kidney function we need more experience because it seems that uh, patients with a high melt score frequently have higher creatinine levels, and it seemed that uh, patients who are uh, placed on alpha pump have a, an increase in serum creatinine in the beginning. So whether uh, alpha pump can precipitate some sort of AKI in patients with a uh, uh, high MEL score is, is, is a possibility, but uh, otherwise it seemed that it's not a contraindication for uh, for. Uh, uh, for alpha pump, and if, if patients are candidates for transplantation, by definition, they are uh, candidates for you know a, a minor surgery such as uh, alpha pump. Okay. One more question. I have a question for uh, Adrian Gadano. Uh, you you alluded to the use of stat statin, but I'm a little bit worried about the safety of this uh, drug. Do, do you have any comment about mm. this? Yes, um, uh, there is also always the a perception of uh, that statins may be harmful in patients with uh, severe liver disease. Uh, and, and I share this. Uh, I think that uh, the safety has been to be studied uh, 
uh, further. Uh, yesterday we discussed with Jaime Bosch in the session in the workshop which dose in which patients, uh, and this is not uh, uh, clearly defined. So further studies. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe you have a question. I have a question for Philip. Uh, yes, for, for sure there is a, a room for li early liver transplantation in selected patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis, but what about those patients who are very severe, who have ACLF grade three, for example? What is your advice? What is the limit? Do you have a, an answer for this? We don't have limit. We don't have limit because we have a paper that has been presented. It was a, a triple experiment from uh, Paul Bruce, uh, uh, Montpellier, and Lille. Uh, the first author was Florent Trou showing that in the, at least in this well experience in NCLF, we don't have any uh, over high, high risk of mortality in those patients. So when a patient with early liver transplantation, transplantation is coming in CLF free meaning renal transplant uh, replacement, uh, ventilation, what we did, now we are not using steroid in this patient because we consider that there is no way he will respond to the therapy. And therefore, if the guy is a good candidate, we will put him on the waiting list using this algorithm score in order to select him. Because I uh, forget to mention that the algorithm score was also design, designed for encephalopathic patient and non encephalopathic so encephalopathic, at that time, the selection will rely mainly on the uh, family surrounding the patient. Thank you. Um, I think that we should close this session. Thank you for uh, two speakers, and uh, thank you to the audience.